All right, today we are going to be reading Chapter 7 of 1984 by George Orwell. Uh, this will not just be a typical audiobook reading. Uh, we're going to explore vocabulary words as we find them. So we'll talk about interesting words. So if you're learning English and, and you also want to read books, <laughs> this is the perfect way to do it because uh, as we go, if there are difficult phrases or interesting phrases, we will stop and talk about them. Or if there are difficult or interesting words, we will stop and define them and talk about them. And I'm doing this live. So if you're watching this live with me, then I encourage you to ask questions in the chat. If I see the questions, I will be happy to answer any anything that or any questions that you have. All right, so let's get started with chapter seven of 1984 by George Orwell. If there is hope, wrote Winston, it lies in the proles. If there was hope, it must lie in the proles, because only there, in those swarming, disregarded masses... All right, now we have this word swarming, and I'm just going to put this up here. Let's see. And they've used this word before, I'm sure of it. But it's not a very common vocabulary word, so it's worth taking a look at it again. Swarming. It's hard to read. Swarming. Wait, let me change that. I put an exclamation point instead of a one. Okay. Swarming. A swarm is... Let's find a picture here. A swarm is how insects come together, or how they travel, or how they socialize. I don't really know. Wait a minute. Where am I going? So you see, this is a swarm of insects. It's almost like a cloud of insects. Mosquitoes, flies, whatever kind of insect you want. That is a swarm. And you can use that with people. So if you say people are swarming, that's a very negative thing. It means a lot of people are coming together like insects for some reason. So, so always when you hear the word swarm, you think of um, <laughs> the picture behind me. Of course, that's not good if it's insects. It's not good if it's people. So when, when you talk about swarms of people, that's a lot of people together in a very negative way, a very negative idea. Let's go back and see how it's used. Let's see. If, if, there, was a, if there was hope, it must lie in the proles, because only there in those swarming, disregarded masses. So the proles, as ha it's been mentioned in previous chapters, uh, are are the common people, and they're not looked upon favorably by the party or by anybody, I guess. And so if you have a lot of them together, you might call them a swarm. You might refer to them as a swarm. Okay, so we've got a swarm of people. Let's see. 85% of the population of Oceania could, could, the, uh, could the force could the force to destroy the party ever be generated? That's weird. That's a weird sentence. Let me read that again. 85, let's see. If there was hope, it must lie in the proles because only there, in those swarming disregarded masses, 85% of the population of Oceania, could the force to destroy the party ever be generated? The party could not be overthrown from within. Its enemies, if it had any enemies, had no way of coming together or even identifying uh, one another. Even if the legendary brotherhood existed, as just possibly it might, it was inconceivable 
that its members could ever assemble in large number and uh, large larger numbers than twos and threes. Rebellion meant a look in the eyes, an inflection of the voice, at the most, an occasional whispered word. Winston is saying that only the proles could probably overthrow the government, their 85% of the population. It could never happen from inside the party. The party members could never do it. And then he's saying that rebellion uh, seems to be little, little things, little gestures, like the, a look in the eye, the tone of your voice, the way that you say things, and the occasional whispered word, so softly, quietly said word. But the proles, if only they could somehow become conscious of their own strength, would have no need to conspire. They needed only to rise up and shake themselves like a horse, shaking off flies. If they chose, they could blow the party to pieces tomorrow morning. Surely sooner or later it must occur to them to do it. And yet... He remembered how once he had been walking down a crowded street when a tremendous shout of hundreds of voices, women's voices, had burst from a side street a little way ahead. It was a great formidable cry of anger and despair. Despair means hopelessness, sadness, no hope. A deep loud, oh, oh, that went humming on like the reverberation of a bell. His heart had leapt. It started, he thought, a riot. The proles are breaking loose at last. I think that we've talked about this phrasal verb before, to break loose, but just in case. It's always worth repeating <laughs> because phrasal verbs are so complicated. Wait, let me, what's going on here? Break loose. Whoops. I'm trying to write this word in the, um, in the program that I'm using to, to stream, <laughs> but I'm doing a very bad job. Well, I don't know if it's me or it's the program that I'm using, but it's a little bit hard to use sometimes. Break loose. Break loose is a phrasal verb, which means to escape. All right, so let's take a look at how it's being used here in this paragraph, which is, where is it? The proles are breaking loose at last. They're escaping, like they're escaping the, the control or the hold of the party. Oh, and finally, you know, actually, we have this other phrase here, at last. Let me put that up here, at last. Which is another way of saying finally. Oh, finally. Finally, it's happening. Oh, uh, we're, so the, the proles are breaking loose at last. The proles are escaping, finally. That's what at last means. That's a pretty useful one. All right. When he had reached this spot, it was to see a mob. A mob is a big group of people. Again, you know, like swarm. We just saw the word swarm, which really is used for insects. But And now mob is another word, another negative word for a group of people. A mob is like a group of people who come together to maybe do violence or to riot or to do something scary, that, uh, to protest. So, but in a, in a, in a not so nice way. So there's a mob of two or 300 women crowding around the stalls of a street market with faces as tragic as though they had been doomed passengers on a sinking ship. But at this moment, the general despair broke down into a multitude of individual quarrels. It appeared that one of the stalls had been selling tin saucepans Tin is uh, aluminum. It's another way of saying aluminum. So I guess uh, 
but let's see what happens. I, I don't know why he's specifying the material as tin. Maybe it will become clear in a minute. They were wretched. Wretched means horrible, dirty, in bad condition. Uh, they were wretched, flimsy things. Flimsy means bad quality. Flimsy means it's like easy to break or easy to bend, not put together very well. And that's what I thought when he said tin saucepans, uh, like a frying pan. If you had a tin frying pan, that would not be very good for cooking, actually. I think that would be pretty bad for cooking. So it's a bad quality in every way. It's flimsy. That means it's very easy to bend or break or not. The handle maybe moves. And it's made of tin, which is not very good quality, not very good for cooking. They were wretched flimsy things. But cooking pots of any kind were always difficult to get. Now the supply had unexpectedly given out. So it wasn't that the quality was bad. It was that there weren't enough. There weren't a sufficient amount of these horrible saucepans. The successful women, bumped and jostled by the rest, were trying to make off with their saucepans. Ah, to make off with something. There's another Phrasal verb for us. I think we're on number four. To make off with something means to take something and then run away with it or escape with something. So you can imagine there were just uh, maybe, let's imagine there were 50 of these frying pans and these horrible frying pans, but there were 300 women who wanted to, to buy them, to take them. So the lucky, one, the lucky ones who got the horrible saucepans got them and then they ran away with them as soon as possible. They made off with the saucepans. I've got to change the background of this writing. It's not very easy to, to read this. Well, I can't do it now. <laughs> I just have to... We just have to deal with it. So now the supply had unexpectedly given out. The successful women bumped and jostled each other, uh, and jostled by the rest, were trying to, to make off with the saucepans, while dozens others clamored around the stall, accusing the stallkeeper of favoritism, and of having more saucepans somewhere in reserve. There was a fresh outburst of yells. Two bloated women, uh, bloated <laughs> kind of means like temporarily fat. So if you eat a, a big dinner, you might feel temporarily fat. You might feel bloated or sometimes people retain water and they get bloated for a few days. Bloated means uh, maybe overstuffed. <laughs> I think here it just means fat. He's, it's kind of a nice way of saying fat. Two bloated women, one of them with her hair coming down, had got hold of the same saucepan and were trying to tear it out of the other's hand. For a moment, they were both tugging. Tugging is like pulling. It's tugging. And then the handle came off. Remember, it's flimsy. That means it's not put together well. So it was very easy to take the handle off from the frying pan. Winston watched them disgustedly. And yet, just for a moment, what, what, uh, what almost frightening power had sounded in that cry from only a few frightening, uh, from only a few hundred throats, why was it that they could never shout like that at anything that mattered? He wrote. So uh, Winston is watching this, and but what he's thinking in his head is they get so angry and so upset over this horrible frying pan. They're fighting over this stupid frying pan, bad quality, bad material, not well made. And they'll fight over that, but they won't fight over their own rights. They won't get angry about their own rights. He wrote... Until they become conscious, they will never rebel. And until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. So until, until they understand that they're kind of prisoners, they'll never rebel. 
but they'll never understand that they're prisoners. So they'll never, so they'll, they'll never rebel. Uh, that, he reflected, might almost have been a transcription from one of the party textbooks. The party claimed, of course, to have liberated the proles from bondage. Before the revolution, they had been hideously oppressed by the capitalists. They had been starved and flogged. Flogged means like beaten, hurt. Women had been forced to work in the coal mines. Women still did work in the coal mines, as a matter of fact. Children had been sold into the factories at the age of six. But simultaneously, true to the principles of doublethink, the party taught that the proles were natural inferiors who must be kept in subjection, like animals, by the application of a few simple rules. In reality, very little was known about the proles. It was not necessary to know much. So long as they continued to work and breathe, their other activities were without importance. Left to themselves like the cattle turned loose upon the plains of Argentina, they had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern. They were born, they grew up in the gutters, Gutter, let's just take a look at a picture of a gutter. Gutter is this part of the street, in case you don't know. Let's see this part where the water goes into the street, which is, you know, that's where all the, the, the rain water goes and the dirt goes. So it's a very dirty place. And so uh, sometimes people talk about being in the gutter. What they mean is being, uh, well, if, if, if you say I grew up in the gutter, that means I grew up in a very dirty, ugly, horrible place horrible neighborhood. And that's what he's talking about here. Where does he mention the word gutter? Yeah, they were born and they grew up in the gutters. So they grew up in the horrible, dirty places. They went to work at 12. They passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire. They married at 20. They were middle-aged at 30. They died for the most part at 60. Heavy physical work, the care of the home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all, gambling, filled up the horizon of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. A few agents of the thought police moved always among them, spreading false rumors and marking down and eliminating a few individuals who were judged capable of becoming dangerous, but no attempt was made to indoctrinate them with the ideology of the party. It was not desirable that the proles should have strong political feelings. All that was required of them was a primitive patriotism which could be appealed to whenever it was necessary to make them accept longer working hours or shorter rations. And even when they became discontented, as they sometimes did, their discontent led nowhere, because being without general ideas, they could only focus it on petty, specific grievances. So they didn't try to make the Poles uh, believe in the ideas of the party. They didn't care. They didn't want them to be familiar with or uh, believe in the ideas of the party. All they wanted from the Poles was that they had some kind of emotional connection to their country so that if they were forced to work longer or make less money or get less food, they would do it because they loved their country. And that's all they wanted from them. They didn't want anything else from them. And if they became unhappy, they would focus their unhappiness on little stupid things like the fight over the frying pan in the market instead of where it really should be focused, which is on the government. 
The larger evils invariably escaped their notice. The great majority of Poles, Proles, <laughs> Poles, let me say that again. The great majority of Proles <laughs> did not even have telescreens in their homes. Even the, in, even the civil police interfered with them very little. There was a vast amount of criminality on, uh, in London. A whole world within a world of thieves, bandits, prostitutes, drug peddlers, and racketeers of every description. But since it all happened among the proles themselves, it was of no importance. In all questions of morals, they were allowed to follow their ancestral code. The sexual puritanism of the party was not imposed upon them. Promiscuity went unpunished. Divorce was permitted. For that matter, even religious worship would have been permitted if the proles had shown any sign of needing or wanting it. They were beneath suspicion. As the party slogan put it, proles and animals are free. Winston reached down and cautiously scratched his varicose ulcer. It had begun itching again. The thing you invariably come back to was the impossibility of knowing what life before the revolution had really been like. He took out he took out of the drawer a copy of a children's history book, which he had borrowed from Mrs. Parsons, and began copying a passage to the diary. In the old days, it ran, before the glorious revolution, London was not the beautiful city that we know today. It was a dark, dirty, miserable place, where hardly anybody had enough to eat, and where hundreds and thousands of poor people had no boots on their feet, and not even a roof to sleep under. Children, no older than you had uh, no older than you had to work twelve hours a day for cruel masters who flogged them with whips if they had worked too slowly, and fed them on nothing but stale bread crusts and water. But in among all this terrible poverty, there were just a few great big beautiful houses, and there and that were, well, let me read that again. There were just a few great, big, beautiful houses that were lived in by rich men who had as many as 30 servants to look after them. These rich men were called capitalists. They were fat, ugly men with wicked faces. Wicked means like evil. Uh, like the one in the picture of the opposite page. You can see that he is dressed in a long black coat, which was called a frock coat, and a queer shiny hat shaped like a stovepipe. Queer means strange, which was called a top hat. This was the uniform of the capitalists, and no one else was allowed to wear it. The capitalists owned everything in the world, and everyone else was their slave. They owned all the land, all of the houses, all of the factories, and all of the money. If anyone disobeyed them, they could throw them in prison, or they could take his job away and starve him to death. When any ordinary people spoke to a capitalist, he had to cringe and bow to him and take off his cap and address him as sir. The chief of all the capitalists was called the king and... But he knew that the rest of the cattle but he knew the rest of the catalog. There would be mention of the bishops in their lawn sleeves, the judges in their ermine robes, the pillory, the stocks, the treadmill, the cat of nine tails, the Lord Mayor's banquet, and the practice of kissing the Pope's toe. There was also something called the Jus Prime Noctis which would probably not be mentioned in the textbook for children. It was the law by which every capitalist had the right to sleep with any woman working in one of his factories. How would you tell how much of it was lies? It might be true that the average human being was better off now than he had been before the revolution. The only evidence to the contrary was the mute protest in your own bones the instinctive feeling that the conditions you lived in 
were intolerable and that at some other time they must have been different. It struck him that the truly characteristic thing about modern life was not its cruelty and insecurity, but simply its bareness. Bare means basic. So he's saying, let's see, it struck him that truly, the truly characteristic thing about modern life was not its cruelty or insecurity, but it's sim simply its bareness. Like there's, there's nothing to, to love. There's nothing, there's nothing around. There's no, uh, no decoration. There's, uh, if something is bare. It's naked. It's very basic. It's very simple. It's dinginess. Dinginess is like um, darkness. Let's get the definition of dingy. Dingy. Gloomy, drab. <laughs> These are other words you probably don't know. Uh, well, gloomy is like dark and depressing and drab means uh, not very attractive, let's say. So dingy is something dark, depressing, not very attractive. And that's that's how he's describing life. <laughs> Modern life is basic. There's nothing around to appreciate or love. It's bare. That's the bareness of it. And then dingy, it's, it's dark, it's depressing. It's not attractive. Listless. Listless means like no emotion. Let's see. Let's let's get a good definition on that too. List, list. To me, it means not showing emotion. But let's let's see. Uh, having or showing little or no interest in anything. Okay, not emotion, but interest. So uh, maybe maybe it just means that there's there's nothing to be interested in. People uh, people are indifferent to everything. Life, if you looked about you, bore no resemblance, not only to the lies that streamed out of the telescreens, but even to the ideals that the party was trying to achieve. Great areas of it, even for a party member, were neutral and non-political, a matter of slogging through dreary jobs, fighting for a place on the tube, darning a worn-out sock, cadging a saccharine tablet, Cadging. What does that mean? Cadging. I've never seen that before. Cadging is informal British, it says, and it says ask for or obtain. So asking for a saccharin tablet. Saccharin is a sugar substitute. So if you're cadging for a saccharin uh, tablet, is that what he said? That's like, hey, you got a you got a saccharin tablet? <laughs> Trying to find someone who has it. Okay. Uh let's see. Catching a saccharin tablet, saving a cigarette end. The ideal set up by the party was something huge, terrible, and glittering. A world of steel and concrete, of monstrous machines and terrifying weapons, a nation of warriors and fanatics marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking of the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans, perpetually working. Perpetual means never stopping, always moving. So perpetually working means always working, never stopping, working. Fighting, triumphing, persecuting, 300 million people, all with the same face. The reality was decaying, dingy cities. Remember, dingy means dark, depressing, ugly. Dingy cities where underfed people shuffled to and fro in leaky shoes. In patched up 19th century houses that smelt always of cabbage and bad lavatories. Lavatory is another word for toilet. He seemed to see it. He seemed to see a vision of London, vast and ruinous, city of a million dustbins, and mixed up with it was a picture of Mrs. Parsons, a woman with a lined face and wispy hair, fiddling helplessly with a uh, blocked waste pipe. I just want to put this word up. I think that's word number five now that we're on. Let's see here. Five to fiddle. 
maybe you've seen the word fiddle before. Fiddle, fiddle actually is kind of another word for violin. You could use the word fiddle to mean violin. It's kind of a, a common violin, I guess you could say. But also to fiddle means like to play with something, like trying to fix it or trying to make it do something. So that's actually kind of an interesting word to fiddle. So here, that's the way that he's using it here. That uh, if, if you remember in chapter two, Mrs. Parsons is trying to fix her sink. She doesn't know what she's doing, so she's just moving things and playing with things, trying to make it work. And that's fiddling with something. Fiddling helplessly with a blocked waste pipe. He reached down and scratched his ankle again. Day and night, the telescreens bruised your ears with statistics, proving that people today had more food, more clothes, better houses, better recreations, that they lived longer, worked shorter hours, were bigger, healthier, stronger, happier, more intelligent, better educated than the people of 50 years ago. Not a word of it could ever be proved or disproved. The party claimed, for example, that today 40% of adults of adult proles were literate. Before the revolution, it was said that that number had only been 15%. Literate means you can read. So according to the official statistics, 40% of the proles were able to read. They were literate. And before the revolution, only 15% were literate. Only 15% could read. The party claimed that the infant, the infant mortality rate was now only 100, uh, 160 per thousand. So a mortality rate, mortality means dying. So uh, only 160 babies per, per 1,000 died. So. Uh, for every 1,000 babies born, only 160 died. That's like 15%. That sounds, I don't know. I don't know what it should be, but that sounds pretty bad. Whereas before the revolution, it had been 300. And so it went on. Went on. To go on is a phrasal verb, which means to continue. Let's put that up here. To go on. Where did they use that? And so it went on, and so it continued. So they're always, uh, what he's saying by that is uh, on the telescreen, they were always comparing now to pre revolutionary days and talking about how much better it was before the proles couldn't read. Now most of them can, or many of them can. Before many babies died, now just a few babies die. And so it went on, and so it continued. They were constantly doing that. It was like a single equation with two unknowns. It might very well be that literally every word in the history books, even the things that one accepted without question, was pure fantasy. For all he knew, there might never have been any such law as jus prime noctis or any such creature as a capitalist, or any such garment as a top hat. Everything faded into mist. The past was erased. The erasure was forgotten. The lie became the truth. Just once in his life he had possessed, after the event, that was, uh, wait, let me, let me read that again. Everything faded into mist. The past was erased. The erasure was forgotten. The lie became the truth. Just once in his life, he had possessed. After the event, that was what counted. Concrete, unmistakable evidence of an act of falsification. Oh, so Winston doesn't know if any of this was really true because they're constantly revising the past and lying about it. So, and then that lie becomes the truth, but then they change their mind again and then they revise it again. 
and there's absolutely no way of knowing what's what was true about the past anymore. And one time, Winston found evidence of the truth of the past. I think that's what they're saying here. Let's see. He had held it between his fingers for as long as 30 seconds. In 1973, it must have been, at any rate. It was about the time that uh, when he and Catherine had parted. But the really relevant date was seven or eight years earlier. The story really began in the middle 60s, the period of the Great Purges, in which the original leaders of the revolution were wiped out once and for all. By 1970, none of them was left except Big Brother himself. All of the rest had by that time been exposed as traitors and counter-revolutionaries. Goldstein had fled and was hiding. No one, knew, uh, no one knew where. And of the others, a few had simply disappeared. While the majority had been executed after spectacular public trials at which they made confession of their crimes. Among the last survivors were three men named Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. It must have been in 1965, and these three had been arrested. As often happened, they had vanished for a year or more, so that one did not know whether they had been alive or dead, and uh, then had suddenly been brought forth to incriminate themselves in the usual way. They had confessed to intelligence with the enemy. At that date, too, the enemy was Eurasia, embezzlement of public funds the murder of various trusted party members, intrigues against the leadership of Big Brother, which had started long before the revolution happened, and acts of sabotage causing death of hundreds of thousands of people. After confessing to these things, they had been pardoned, reinstated in the party, and given posts, which were in fact... I don't know what that word is. Sinecures? Let me see this word here. Sinecures. A position requiring little or no work, but giving the holder status or financial benefit. Oh, well, that's a very... How do you pronounce this? Sinecure. 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 Okay. Wow. Well, I think they do that now, don't they? Let's see. Let's, let's reread that part. After confessing to these, they had been pardoned. So a pardon is like an official forgiveness. If you, if you commit a crime, but the judge or whoever pardons you, that means you will not be punished. You're, you're forgiven of the crime. So after they confess, they're pardoned. They're forgiven. It's like they never committed the crime. Reinstated in the party. So they, they're allowed to join the party again after their confession. And giving posts which were in fact sinecures. So they were given jobs where they don't do anything, but they're given a lot of respect or money. Well, that sounds like today. But which sounded important. All three had written long, abject articles in the Times, analyzing the reasons for their defection and promising to make amends. Sometime after the release, Winston had actually seen all three of them in the Chestnut Tree Cafe. He remembered the sort of terrified fascination with which he had watched them out of the corner of his eye. To watch someone out of the corner of, their, of your eye is, you know, you're looking this way, but then, you, I don't know if you can see me on the camera doing this. Uh, so you're looking, your face is like this direction, but your eyes are are looking that direction. I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> but that's looking at something out of the corner of your eye. That's pretty useful. Let me, I'm just going to write that down. So I think that's number seven. Out of the corner of your eye. I'll probably make little videos about these later. So out of the corner of your eye.
They were men far older than himself, relics of the ancient world, almost the last great figures left over from the heroic days of the party. The glamour of the underground struggle and the civil war still faintly clung to them. He had the feeling, though, already at that time, uh, facts and dates were growing blurry, and he had known their names years earlier uh, than he had known that of Big Brother. But also, they were outlaws. Outlaws means people hiding from the police. So they were outlaws. That means that they were hiding from the government or the police. Enemies, untouchables, doomed with absolute certainty to extinction within a year or two. No one who had once fallen into the hands of the Thought Police ever escaped in the end. They were corpses waiting to be sent back to the grave. There was no one at any of the tables nearest to them. It was not wise even to be seen in the neighborhood of such people. They were sitting in silence before glasses of the gin flavored with cloves, which was uh, the specialty of the cafe of the three. It was Rutherford, whose appearance had most impressed Winston. Rutherford had once been a famous caricaturist. A caricature, by the way, well, maybe we'll just, is like an exaggerated drawing of something. Caricature. So let's take a look. It's very common, especially for political cartoons, to show caricatures. Uh, let's see if I can find a good example of a caricature. Maybe like this. It's kind of like a cartoon, but the point of a caricature, a caricature is that it should be like uh, an exaggerated drawing. It should look funny. It shouldn't look exactly like you. It should be uh, a funny picture of you. It's used a lot in uh, political humor. Those are caricatures. So one of these three outlaws that Winston saw at the cafe was a caricaturist. So he was an artist who made these funny drawings of people. Of the three, it was Rutherford whose appearance had most impressed Winston. Rutherford had once been a famous caricaturist whose brutal cartoons had helped to inflame popular opinion before and during the revolution. Even now, at long intervals, his cartoons were appearing in the Times. They were simply an imitation of his earlier manner and curiously lifeless and unconvincing. So remember, these people had offended the party, become criminals, then they confessed in public, and then they were able to return to the party but everybody knew to keep their distance because even even though they can even though they were supposedly accepted back into the party everyone knew that in one or two years they would they would be disappeared but so now they're just kind of pretending to live their lives and so this famous caricaturist uh, still did pay, still did caricatures he still made cartoons for the newspaper but you could see the difference like his old work had his spirit in it. And the new work, he was just making the drawings and they, they weren't that interesting anymore because uh, probably even he knew that sooner or later he was gone. Always, they were rehashing uh, of the ancient themes, slum tenements, starving children, street battles, capitalists and top hats, even on the barricades, the capitalists still cling, seem to cling to their top hats. An endless, hopeless effort to get back into the past. That's very interesting. So he's saying, because, because these were like the old revolutionary guys from the, the original revolution, when maybe there really were capitalists in top hats. But that was all gone. 
And it was a completely different world, but they were still sitting there in that cafe, obsessed with all of these causes that don't exist anymore. It's a completely changed world, but they're still obsessed with these causes. Very, very interesting. Let's see. Even on the barricades, the capitalists still seem to cling to their top hats. An endless, hopeless effort to get back into the past. He was a monstrous man with a mane of greasy gray hair. His face pouched and seamed with thick negroid lips. At one time, he must have been immensely strong. Now his great body was sagging, sloping, bulging, falling away in every direction. He seemed to be breaking up before one's eyes, like a mountain crumbling. It was the lonely hour of 15. Winston could not remember how he had come to be in the cafe at such a time. The place was almost empty. A tinny music was trickling from the telescreens. The three men sat in their corner almost motionless, never speaking, uncommanded. The waiter brought fresh glasses of gin. There was a chessboard on the table beside them with the pieces set out, but no game started. And then for perhaps a minute in all, something happened to the telescreen. The tune they were playing changed and the tone of the music changed too. There came into it. What does that mean? There came into it. That doesn't make any sense to me. There came into it. There, oh, maybe there came into it. No, but it was something hard to describe. It was a peculiar, cracked, braying, jeering note. In his mind, Winston called it a yellow note. And then a voice from the telescreen was singing. Under the spreading chestnut tree, I sold you and you sold me. There lie they and here lie we under the spreading chestnut tree. The three men never stirred. Stirring means moving. So that means that they always stayed still. They didn't move. But when Winston glanced again at Rutherford's ruinous face, he saw that his eyes were full of tears. And for the first time he noticed with a kind of inward shudder. A shudder is, ooh. So, but it's an inward shudder because remember, you can't show your emotions in public in, in this world. So this was an inward, he was doing this, ooh. But inside, he wasn't showing it. And yet not knowing at what he shuddered. So he, he had this, this feeling, but he didn't know why that both Aronson and Rutherford had broken noses. A little later, all three were rearrested. It appeared that they had engaged in fresh conspiracies from the very moment of their release. At their second trial, they confessed to all their old crimes over again with a whole string of new ones. They were executed and their fate was recorded in the party histories, a warning to posterity. Above, about five years after this, in 1973, Winston was unrolling a, uh, unrolling a wad of documents. If you have a wad of something, it's uh, usually kind of maybe oh wait, like this, kind of rolled up. It's a wad of something. So he, un he unrolled a wad of documents. which had just flopped out of a pneumatic tube onto his desk when he came on a fragment of paper, which had evidently been slipped in among the others and then forgotten. The instant he had flattened it out, he saw a significance, its significance. It was, uh, it was a half page torn out of the times of about 10 years earlier. The top half of the page so that it included the date and it contained a photograph of the delegates 
at some party function in New York. Prominent in the middle of the group were Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. There was no mistaking them. In any case, their names were in the caption at the bottom. The point was that at both trials, all three men had confessed that on, the, on that date, they had been in the Eurasian soil. They had flown from a secret airfield in Canada to a rendezvous somewhere in Siberia. A rendezvous is a meeting and had conferred with the members of the Eurasian general staff to whom they had betrayed important military secrets. The date had struck Winston, had stuck in Winston's memory because it chanced to be Midsummer Day. But the whole story must be on record in countless other places as well. There was only one possible conclusion. The confessions were lies. Of course, this was not itself a discovery. Even that time, Winston had not imagined that the people who were wiped out in the purges had actually committed the crimes. I'm just going to put this word wipe out to be wiped. Well, maybe to be wiped out. Let's see, that's like number eight, I think. To be wiped out. Which here, wipe out could mean, like most phrasal verbs, can mean several things. But here, to be wiped out means to be erased. That's how it's being used here. So let's see. Let's reread that where it was. Oh, I can't find it. Let's just keep going. Of course, this was not in itself a discovery. Even that time, Winston... Uh, had not imagined that the people who were wiped out, erased in the purges, disappeared, erased, had actually committed the crimes that they were accused of. But this was concrete evidence. It was a fragment of the abolished past, like a fossil bone, which turns up in the wrong stratum and destroys a geological theory. It was enough to blow the party to atoms, if in some way it could ever be published to the world, its significance made known. He had gone straight on working. As soon as he saw what the photograph was and what it meant, he had covered it up with another sheet of paper. Luckily, when he unrolled it, it had been upside down from the point of view of the telescreen. He took his scribbling pad on his knee and pushed back his chair so as to get far away from the telescreen as possible. To keep your face expressionless was not difficult, and even your breathing could be controlled with an effort, but you could not control the beating of your heart, and the telescreen was quite delicate enough to pick it up. He let what he judged to be a ten minute uh, ten minute go I mean he, he let what what he judged to be ten minutes go by, tormented all the while by fear that so that some accident, a sudden drought, blowing a sudden draft blowing across his desk, for instance, would betray him. Then, without uncovering it again, he dropped the photograph into the memory hole, along with some other waste. It would have been crumbled into ashes. Oh wait, <laughs> let me read that again. Within another minute, perhaps, it would have crumbled into ashes. That was 10, 11 years ago. Today, probably, he would have kept that photograph. It was curious that the fact of having held it in his fingers seemed to him to make a difference even now, when the photograph itself, as well as the event it recorded, was only a memory. Was the party's hold upon the past less strong, he wondered, because a piece of evidence which existed no longer had once existed. But today, supposing that it could be somehow resurrected from its ashes, the photograph might not even be evidence. Already at the time when he made his discovery, Oceania was no longer at war with Eurasia, and it must have been to the agents of East Asia that the three dead men 
had betrayed their country. So he's thinking this is major evidence uh, that they were in Eurasia, but now, now they're not at war with Eurasia anymore. Now they're at war with East Asia. So they must have been enemies of East Asia and not Eurasia because we're friends with Eurasia now. Since then, there had been other changes. Two, three, he could not remember how many. Very likely, the confessions had been rewritten and rewritten until the original facts and dates no longer have the smallest significance. The past was not only changed, but changed continuously. What most afflicted him with the sense of nightmare was that he had never clearly understood why the huge imposture was undertaken. The immediate advantages of falsifying the past were obvious, but the ultimate motive was mysterious. He took up his pen again and wrote, I understand how. I don't understand why. He wondered, as he had many times wondered before, whether he himself was a lunatic. A lunatic is a crazy person. Perhaps a lunatic was simply a minority of one. At one time, it had been a sign of madness to believe that the Earth was, uh, goes round the sun. Today, to believe that the past is inalterable. Well, let me read that again. At one time, it had been a sign of madness to believe that the Earth goes round the sun. Today, to believe that the past is inalterable. He might be alone in holding that belief, and if alone, then a lunatic. But the thought of being a lunatic did not greatly trouble him. The horror was that he might also be wrong. Winston's thinking, am I crazy? Uh, am I the only one who can see this? Am, am I just crazy? Uh, and that didn't bother him, thinking, am I crazy? But what did bother him was thinking, am I wrong? Am I just mistaken? Did this really happen? That bothered him. He picked up the children's history book and looked at the portrait of Big Brother, which formed its, its uh, frontispiece. The hypnotic eyes gazed into his own. It was as though some huge force were passing down upon you, something that penetrated inside your skull, battering against your brain, frightening you out of your beliefs, persuading you almost to deny the evidence of your senses. In the end, the party would announce that two and two made five. So in the end, the party would say two plus two equals five, and you would have to believe it. It was inevitable that they should make that claim sooner or later. The logic of their position demanded it. Not merely the validity of experience, but the very existence of external reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. The heresy of heresies was common sense. So remember, they're always using religious terminology here. And a heresy is saying something against a religion. And so uh, the heresy of heresies, the biggest heresy that you could commit, the biggest crime against the political party that you could commit was common sense. That was the worst thing that you could do. The biggest offense to the party was thinking for yourself and having some common sense. And what was terrifying was not that they would kill you for thinking otherwise, but that they might be right. So having common sense was, uh, if you disagreed with them because you had common sense, it wasn't scary that they would kill you for that. But the scary part was, what if I'm wrong and what if they're right? What if two plus two really is five? They make you doubt yourself. For after all, how do we know that two and two make four? Or that the force of gravity works? Or that the past is unchangeable? If both the past and the external world exist only in the mind, and if the mind itself is controlled, what then? 
But no, his courage seems suddenly to stiffen of its own accord. The face of O'Brien, not called up by obvious association, had floated into his mind. He knew with more certainty than before that O'Brien was on his side. He was writing the diary for O'Brien, to O'Brien. It was like an interminable letter which no one would ever read, but which was addressed to a particular person and took its color from that fact. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and your ears. It was their final, most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against him, the ease with which any party intellectual would overthrow him in debate, the subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less answer, and yet he was in the right. They were wrong, and he was right. The obvious, the silly, and the true had got to be defended. Truisms are true. Hold on to that. The solid world exists. Its laws do not change. Stones are hard. Water is wet. Objects, unsupported, fall towards the Earth's center. With the feeling that he was speaking to O'Brien, and also that he was setting forth an important axiom, he wrote, Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. All right. Well, that was the end of chapter seven of 1984. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> pretty amazing stuff if you think about where we live today. Okay, uh, next time we will take a look at chapter 8 of 1984. And thank you everyone who stayed and watched until the end. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.